Welcome to Fairport Flash, the monthly economic update powered by the Fairport Investment Team. Our team gathers the most recent news, data, and research and distills it into the information most important to you. Let's get started. Hi, this is Jason Adams, Portfolio Manager at Fairport and Luma Wealth, with another edition of the Fairport Flash, titled Not Your Parents' Inflation, or Is It? In last November's Flash, I talked about what our investment team believed to be the top three issues that would impact markets and the economy heading into this year. While several topics came up, the three that percolated to the top were COVID, monetary policy, and inflation. With the release of the Consumer Price Index, or CPI, last Thursday, February 14th, I thought it would be timely to revisit inflation and take a look at past inflationary periods to see what we could learn about this episode and how it could impact our outlook and investment decision-making process going forward. I mentioned last week's CPI. We learned prices for all goods and services increased a stronger than expected 0.6% in January from December, driven by increases in food, electricity, and shelter, putting the year-over-year increase at 7.5%, the largest such increase since 1982. Looking at the chart, you can see the CPI has increased more than 0.5% per month in seven of the last 10 months. The biggest year-over-year increase was used vehicle prices, which were up a staggering 40% from January 2021, while energy was second, increasing 27%. As you can see on the next chart, inflation has been above 5% since May of last year. Since World War II, there have been six such periods with inflation above the 5% level. July 1946 through October 1948, inflation surged following the end of World War II, jumping to over 20% as supply chains had to readjust from manufacturing for the war to meeting consumer demand and pent-up demand being released into the economy. Price controls instituted during the war were also eliminated, allowing prices to surge. Similar bouts of inflation happened after the Civil War as well as World War I. Then, in December 1950 through December 1951, Demand once again jumped as households rushed to purchase goods as a return to wartime status related to the Korean War, created fears of rationing and supply shortages that were plentiful during World War II. Supply chains again were also impacted as production shifted back to military materials. Then in March of 1969 through January of 1971, changes in monetary policy, spending on the Vietnam War, fiscal spending tied to Lyndon B. Johnson's Great Society, and the booming economy of the late 60s all contributed to cause inflation to increase over 5%. Following a short two-year break, back in April of 1973, through October of 1982, the longest, arguably most economically painful inflationary episode was largely tied to OPEC's oil embargo in 1973, then another oil shock shortly thereafter tied to the Iranian Revolution and Iran-Iraq War. It took Fed Chair Paul Volcker raising short-term interest rates to 20% by June of 1981 to ultimately break the cycle. Inflation stayed benign again until April of 1989, this time lasting through May of 1991, again driven by more unrest in the Middle East tied to Iraq's invasion of Kuwait, which led to significantly higher crude oil prices, leading to a brief two-year bout of higher prices. Then our last bout of inflation of over 5% happened in July of 2008, lasting only two months, and it was again a tie to a price in oil and gasoline prices. The price of oil increased from $70 a barrel to over $140 a barrel in one year, causing this very short burst of higher prices, which was soon followed by declines. So before we dive into this current episode of inflation, a few observations on the six episodes that we're examining since World War II. First, the price of oil and unrest in the Middle East were central in three of the six episodes, including the three most recent. War was involved with five of the six inflationary episodes, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Iran, Iraq, and ultimately the Gulf War. Third, supply chain issues were evident in the first two episodes, again due to aligning resources to manufacture military goods. Fourth, aggressive government spending, pent-up demand, rapid economic growth, and stimulative monetary and fiscal policies were evident in the majority of these inflationary periods. Lastly, recessions happened after or around each of the inflationary episodes, as you can see on this slide. So you can see recession happened 29 months after after inflation began in 1946, 
31 months after December 1950, nine months after March of 1969, and eight months after April of 1973. There were three recessions over the nine-year Great Inflation that began in 1973, and in 1989, recession followed 14 months after inflation crossed the 5% mark. Lastly, in July of 2008, we were already in the throes of the great financial crisis when prices briefly surged for that two-month period tied to the rapid increase in price of oil. Now let's talk about the current episode of elevated inflation. As I mentioned, we crossed the 5% level last May, so this period is already significantly longer than 2008. And at 7.5%, we are above the levels reached in 1989, which takes us back to the end of the great inflation at the beginning of the 1980s to find a period of higher inflation than we are experiencing today. Now, let's discuss a few of the similarities between today and past inflationary episodes, then a few of the differences, and finally our view on the current environment and how it's impacting our outlook. So starting with the similarities. First, pent-up demand tied to the economic shutdown is similar to the post-World War II period. As I mentioned, the Korean War also led to accelerated demand tied to consumers avoiding shortages. This chart shows consumer spending, which has increased 18% or more than $2 trillion since the beginning of the pandemic, evident, evidence of just how much pent-up demand existed. Next, supply chain issues have played a role in price pressures much like they did following World War II and the Korean War. Delivery times are at more than a two-decade highs as evidenced by this chart. Third, the U.S. economy grew rapidly post-World War II and in the late 60s, much as it is today. In 2021, real quarterly GDP growth topped 6% in three of the four quarters. Just for some comparisons, from 1965 to 1969, which again was a period of rapid economic growth, we averaged 4.5% per year. So you can see just how fast we're growing. We grew in 2021. And then lastly, aggressive fiscal spending. In 2020, the federal government spent over $6.5 trillion in response to COVID, an increase of over 47% versus 2019. Then followed that up with another $7.2 trillion in 2021. As a percentage of GDP, the deficits were the largest since World War II. Fiscal spending was also robust during the 1960s as part of LBJ's Great Society. In fact, 1968 was the biggest budget deficit since the World War II up to that point. Shortly thereafter, in 1971 and 1972, the second and third largest deficits since World War II happened under the leadership of President Nixon. So that's it for the similarities. Now, now let's focus on what we think the differences are between this current inflationary period and inflationary periods that we've looked at since World War II. Number one, we're not at war. However, that could change at any day as tensions continue to build between Russia and Ukraine, as you can see on this chart of military presence surrounding Ukraine. Another geopolitical risk we're monitoring is the relationship between China and Taiwan. The next difference is price and wage controls were used during World War II and the 1970s, and both played a pretty significant role in fanning inflation. Obviously, those are not present today and will likely never be used again considering their failure in the 1970s. Third, the U.S. is now a major energy producer far less reliant on foreign oil. In 2020, for example, we produce more oil than we consumed, and with rig counts again on the rise production is expected to increase this year. Next, significant investment in renewable fuels is underway and will accelerate, thereby further reducing U.S. demand for oil. Investment renewal, as you can see on this slide, topped $500 billion in 2020 and again will continue to accelerate in the years to come. Lastly, growth in the Federal Reserve balance sheet and 0% federal funds rate are unique to this current situation. Unarguably, monetary policy played a role in each of these inflationary periods, but what we've seen from the current Federal Reserve has certainly been unprecedented in history with unprecedented growth in the Fed balance sheet, as well as the 0% interest rate policies. So certainly this is not an exhaustive list, but I do think it provides valuable contents to think about the current situation. As I mentioned, the name of this podcast is Not Your Parents' Inflation, or Is It? 
As someone born in the 1970s, I feel a high level of conviction we are not on the precipice of a decade-long bout of high inflation like we experienced in the 70s. Several factors played into inflation during that era, unions, price and wage controls, aggressive fiscal spending, but at the heart of it really was oil. For reasons already discussed, that is far less of a risk today. I suspect this period will be more similar to the 1940s and 1950s, so if you're part of the baby boomers, this period could be similar to your parents' inflation. Those two periods lasted 15 months on average. We believe that time frame could be applied to the current scenario, and our hopeful inflationary pressures could peak as soon as this month for several reasons and hopefully drop below 5% in the back half of this year. Clearly, some of the forces driving inflation are related to the pandemic and therefore temporary. Supply chains will improve. Lead times are already falling from their recent peaks. Used car prices will not increase another 40% year over year as they did in January. Secondly, the Fed is expected to start raising rates in March and end quantitative easing which should ease price pressures and control inflation expectations. Third, federal outlays are expected to decline significantly in 2022 by more than a trillion dollars, which could help deepen the labor pool for other businesses and other industries. Fourth, spending on goods has far exceeded spending on services since the start of the pandemic. That should abate as vaccination rates and immunity to COVID continue to increase, thereby easing the pressure on goods pricing where the vast majority of inflation has happened. Fifth, worker availability and the labor participation rate should improve for those same reasons, thereby reducing upward pressure on wages. Moreover, many of the federal outlays discussed earlier were direct payments to consumers. Many of those payments went to savings. As those savings get spent, more people should go back to work. One thing we are keeping a very close eye on is inflation expectations because actual inflation depends partly on what we expect it to be. If a business expects inflation to be 3%, that business will likely want to raise prices by at least that much. Similarly, a worker or union that expects inflation of 3% will want wages to increase by at least that much. Importantly, long-term inflation expectations are still very well contained as evidenced by the 10-year break-even chart. Shorter-term break evens are slightly higher than the 10-year, but well below current inflation readings. So despite these inflationary forces that we believe will be temporary and well-anchored inflation expectations, the risks of higher-than-expected inflation forcing the Fed to raise rates faster than expected or shrink their balance sheet more than they'd like to have clearly increased since the fall. The biggest risk, in my view, is that the economy stays strong, reopening activity increases as Omicron cases decline, and increased spending on services increases demand for service workers, thereby straining an already shallow labor pool, which would lead to still higher wages and companies raising their prices to maintain margins, also known as a wage price spiral. Another important long-term inflationary force that needs to be monitored is the cost of shelter, whether it be home ownership or rents. Once rents go up, they tend to stay up and will be persistent. In a scenario that includes one or both of these outcomes, the Fed might be forced to hit the brakes harder than the market anticipates, and interest rates could rise more than expected, likely leading to disruptions across financial markets. We have adjusted our portfolios to account for these risks by increasing our allocation to energy and areas that benefit from higher rates, such as financials. We also recommend considering private real estate allocations, as real estate has been a good hedge against inflation historically. Clearly, the risks are growing, but we do not think recession is in the cards in 2022. We think the economy will continue to grow, albeit at a decelerating rate, thereby driving earnings, and if earnings are going up, it's very rare that markets don't follow. Furthermore, equities historically are one of the best inflation hedges. Therefore, we continue to slightly overweight equities. Volatility will likely be elevated as we work through the upcoming changes to monetary policy, but earnings are expected to grow more than 10% this year, which should drive high single-digit returns for calendar year 2022 and double-digit returns from current levels. We also encourage our clients to use alternative strategies to diversify their equity risk as bonds currently offer negative real returns or returns adjusted for inflation. Not to say that bonds are not an important part of a portfolio. They are very important. 
They are designed to protect principal, generate income, and diversify other parts of the portfolio, so we want to maintain positions, but we recommend being underweight relative to long-term strategic targets. Stay diversified, stay disciplined through any of the upcoming volatility. Take advantage of the volatility by rebalancing portfolios to targeted allocations. Also, talk to your advisor about private real estate. There are excellent solutions for accredited investors that provide an inflation hedge, as well as a relatively attractive income stream and further diversification. So in summary, we are currently in our seventh post-World War II bout of inflation of over 5%. Previous episodes were anywhere from two months to nine years in duration. We initially crossed 5% in May of 2021 and believe inflation could peak as early as this month, then fall below 5% as we enter the back half of the year as supply chains adjust, people return to work, the Fed raises rates and ends quantitative easing, and the federal government reduces spending. The risk that inflation becomes more of a problem for markets and policymakers is certainly increasing, and we have made adjustments to our portfolio to account for that, but we remain steadfast in our outlook that we will avoid recession, and by the end of the year, the stock market will have set new highs on the back of strong earnings growth. Diversification, discipline, and long-term thinking remain paramount. So there you have it, a deep dive into inflation. Again, I don't think it will be my parents' inflation, Rather, it will be more closely resemble the inflation found in the decades of the late 1940s and 1950s. But in all likelihood, when we look back on this period, it will probably look more different than similar compared to each of the previous episodes. Hopefully, you found this podcast informative. I know I learned a lot putting it together. Thank you so much for your time and giving it a listen. I encourage you to call your advisor with questions or strategies on how to address the constantly changing economic and market landscape and discuss how your portfolio is addressing the risk of inflation. Until next time, wishing you and yours all the best. Fairport is a group of investment professionals registered with Hightower Securities, LLC, a member of FINRA and SIPC, and with Hightower Advisors, LLC, a registered investment advisor with the SEC. Securities are offered through Hightower Securities, LLC. Advisory services are offered through Hightower Advisors, LLC. This is not an offer to buy or sell securities. No investment process is free of risk, and there's no guarantee that the investment process or the investment opportunities referenced herein will be profitable. Past performance is not indicative of current or future performance and is not a guarantee. The investment opportunities referenced herein may not be suitable for all investors. All data and information referenced herein are from sources believed to be reliable. Any opinion, news, research, analysis, prices, or other information contained in the research is provided as a general market commentary. It does not constitute as investment advice. Airport and Hightower shall not be in any way liable for claims and make no express or implied representations or warranties as to the accuracy or completeness of the data and other information, or for statements and errors contained in or omissions from the obtained data and information referenced herein. The data and information are provided as of the date referenced. Such data and information are subject to change without notice. This document was created for informational purposes only. The opinions expressed are solely those of Fairport and do not represent those of Hightower Advisors, LLC, or any of its affiliates.